Thanks. Um, I get all the clean jobs. That's, that's, that's what they give me. I come at this whole thing from a kind of a different perspective because I'm with the Cornell Waste Management Institute. So everything's waste to us, and we look to add ba benefit to it and value to it. Um, so when I was asked to do this, I submitted the abstract, and they said, well, you can't just do horses. It's got to be broader than that because there's a lot of mortality out there to deal with. That's really what it is. I am concentrating more on horses, but I did add other pictures in there just to make people happy. But same process, just a little bit, tweet, bit, a little bit of tweaking in different ways. Um, situation. The rendering industry is not in good shape in most places. Uh, it's not that it's not in good shape. It's in fine shape. It just was overexpanded at one point. Um, and we were feeding cows to cows and cows to chickens and stuff like that. And then we realized that we, that really wasn't a real market. So we, uh, the rendering industry has downsized and they can take less flesh waste, basically. Um, specified risk materials, so things like prions, uh, mad cow disease, chronic wasting disease, those things. I don't think we have those issues in, in horses, do we? I don't think there's a prion disease that affects horses. Um, cost, and people just didn't have access to, to rendering and stuff. What are the disposal options for flesh waste? Um, alkaline digestion. Um, there aren't a lot of those around. Colorado State had one. I don't know if it's still working. Uh, Cornell has one because they wouldn't let us replace our incinerator, so they ended up putting in uh, digestion, alkaline digestion. Um, Iowa's got one. There aren't a lot of them around, that's my point. So it's an option, but not a, not a very available option. Rendering, we just talked about. Mass burial. When we mass bury things, whether it's from fire or disease or whatever, we're putting those animals six feet closer to the water table. That's water that we want to drink, and we want it to be clean. So when we bury, we really have to think hard about that. Um, we went to entombing or encasing bodies, human bodies, in cement. But we put an animal in the ground, and it, it is. It's a lot of liquid to go in the ground without any sanitation. And we really can't sanitize an animal without doing some, val some extra processing. Open burning, not popular. Um, you can't boil, you can't burn water. It just doesn't work very well. Um, and compost turns out to be a pretty e simple uh, thing to do. We can, the time that it would take somebody to compost an animal, the time out of your schedule is like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if you have the materials already and lined up. So that's what we'll talk about. Um, risk materials, mad cow, things like that. We don't want to compost those animals because we don't know that we can disable those prion chains, those protein chains. So it's something that we just we deal with through veterinarians and say, we think we might have a problem here. So they can rule that out. Uh, does the process have environmental implications? Sure. We have to think about how it's done. Um, we have to look at water, soil, air and bringing those animals in to a, a central facility. This happens to be a um, facility where we're just composting manure and it wasn't being done too well. I use it because it's a negative. They had put the windrow right across a roadway and so there was a natural nice pathway for all the leachate to go right down and they just should have stopped in that grass filter strips because in those grassed areas, we're in great shape because the nutrients will be taken up in those grassed areas. But when they extended it across the road, it was a problem. So, you know, just logistics. Um, but we do have to think about things. Um, as far as air emissions in compost, we're, we're, we uh, win when, it's, uh, when we're talking about carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions. We just don't have high um, of either of those. We do have to think about water, and we want to we want to be careful about where we're citing these things. So, so we have to cite well. We don't necessarily. Some people will say, "Oh, put it in a real high, dry place." That doesn't always work for mortality composting. 
And the reason it doesn't is because we have downslope winds in all places. <laughs> and in the evening when people are out in their yards, you know, playing and doing things, all of a sudden it's like, well, where did that smell come from? <laughs> it's these downslope areas that, that can give us, that can move air around and move odor around. So we want to be away from groundwater, surface water, and our animals drinking water, uh, whether it's a, a well or a, their wells or not. We have to be a little careful of that. The 200 feet is not a magic number. That's not regulated anywhere. I've seen two and 300. Um, and it, you know, you just have to be smart about how far away from, how far away from water you want to be. And also, uh, especially since this is a, um, some of the horses that we're talking about are in more urban areas, we don't put them right up on the property line. <laughs> you know, so that they're right next to the neighbors and not next to our house. That's one of the placements that we see a lot of times is people will put it as far away from their house as they can and it's on somebody else's property or close to somebody else's property. <clears throat> um, what we do is we lay down a carbon bed. So there's, you're going to hear a lot about carbon and nitrogen here. But we put down a bed of, of chunky wood chips when we're going to compost an animal. We don't put a lot of dense material, we don't put liquid manure down, we don't put any of those things down, we don't put it right on the ground. We put it on a bed of carbon. That's a really important thing and as we go through this you'll see why that's a really important thing. So we're laying that bed down. In this particular case the plastic is, was used just because we were doing research. Um, and you could take a good picture. It g gave us great contrast there so you could actually see. But we do compost right on the soil. Uh, rarely are we composting on, on pads. <clears throat> We're going to place the animal in the center of the bed, and we want to make sure that, you know, even hooves, that there's two feet of material around that animal, all the way around. We may need to slice the abdomen or any of the large organs that have a lot of, hold a lot of gas because well, <laughs> we were doing research on some animals and we had some folks in from Brazil that we were teaching them and we thought, oh, these horses just don't, they're not going to blow. They're not going to have problems. And we came back and the legs sticking out of the, the pile. <laughs> we're like, oh man, we guess we should have done that. It was a really hot time and we should have, should have followed our rules. So uh, you'll see animals bloating on the side of the road. You'll see all that kind of stuff. You just have to... Um, you probably want to poke the animal before you put it in a pile. Um, when we're talking about, and I'm featuring all different animals in here, these are deer, white-tailed deer, uh, roadkill. We do a lot of roadkill. I've taught roadkill in a lot of states around the country, a lot of states we've implemented, including Yellowstone National Park, where we compost buffalo. Um, we can layer those animals, so the smaller animals we can layer, and I say, yeah, I usually have the rule, if you can lift, you can layer. So if you can pick it up and put it on the second layer, then you can do that with a horse. I'm not gonna pick it up and put it on the second layer. I might have a big piece of equipment that can do that, but that's a lot of weight to have two horses on top of each other if you were really doing something, composting a lot of horses. Um, so pigs, chickens, deer, um, goats, things like that, we're gonna put in layers. So we put 24 inches down of carbon down. And when we're putting carbon down, we're talking about wood chips. Okay, we really want wood chips. We can use manures, but manures are denser than I want them to be. They don't allow that air to flow. And this is gonna be a system where we're not gonna do any turning. We're gonna let this process work all by itself. So put them in layers. We can do two to three layers of deer. Usually two is enough because I don't wanna lift them that high. Chickens, um, and chickens we want to do, we can do three, four, five, six layers of chickens, and we'll put those in. If we're composting mortality, or if we're composting, period, in really dry climates, we need to add water. We need to make sure, like when we're doing, I was teaching a class in New Mexico, we, let, we wet all the layers, the animal included, and we wet everything as we built that pile so that you can keep as much moisture in that pile as possible. <clears throat> large animals, cows, horses, whales, pigs, 
or large pigs. Um, all of those can be composted. I'm, darn it, I knew it. Can you run down that table and grab that pile? I have fact sheets that you can pa we can pass around. I knew I was going to leave them over there. Um, there are three on top, and the three on top, somebody can keep them. I don't have a problem with that, but those are poultry and um, natural rendering I have a lot of, so that's all animals. Poultry I have one of, horse I have one of, because we just didn't print a lot. We're the Waste Management Institute, so we expect them, people to get the stuff offline. Um, anyway, those can go around. Um, for large animals, cows, we can put them in a pile by themselves because we have the right carbon to nitrogen ratio, and I know that sounds gross, but we have that in there. If we were just doing a deer, one deer, we would want to add more nitrogen to it because we wouldn't have a, a proper carbon to nitrogen balance. And when we're doing this, it's all wrong to start with. It really is all wrong. It's not the right composting process, but it all turns out the right way in the end. So we just have to trust the process, and I'll go through that as we, as we go. After we lay the animal in the pile, we want to make sure that we put carbon over top of it. This is where we can be more creative with some of the materials that we use. We can put um, spent silage, spent feed, um, corn husk, corn, corn cob, things like that. Those can go over top of the animal. Um, some hay, but hay tends to blow if we have a windy, uh, windy you know, time. So you, it has to have enough weight to actually be there. If we go back, if we haven't sliced the rumen of an animal, especially a cow, and we go back and there's no material on top, we can kind of see the cow, it blew. It's blown. So the, you know, they do explode. And we have a, had a situation in, uh, I'll tell some fun stories. We had a situation in, uh, in Japan where there was a whale, and the university wanted to study that whale. So they put it on a, on a, you know, a truck, and they hauled it back to the university, and it blew in the middle of a city in Japan. And there are still oil stains on that city. It took out some bicycles. It took destroyed some cars. It's a serious issue, so we want to make sure we've taken care of that. Um, this is a situation where greener pastures, these are different greener pastures than we've been talking about earlier. Greener pastures was a, a, a compost facility that would take other people's horses, and it was just for horses, and they uh, windrowed those horses and, and took in probably four or 500 animals in their time. Um, we can do it in um, covered bins. Sometimes we do that. Generally, we're doing it outdoors. We're doing it at windrows. It depends on how much we have in, how many animals we're actually dealing with. We want to make sure that everything is covered, though. Um, we don't want things sticking out. And we've always said, you know, are we raising livestock or dead stock? Do we want the wildlife to come closer to our, to our livestock or not? And we really don't. For disease issues and for taking on those young, fresh animals. Everybody know how to make silage here? Okay, so making silage is opposite, the opposite process of making compost. When we make silage, um, we're compressing all the air out of that medium, out of that organic matter. It's almost a fermentation process. It is a fermentation process. When we're take, making compost, we want to take air in from the bottom and allow the CO2 to leave the pile. So we have air circulating through the pile all the time. So we want it to be as light and fluffy as possible instead of as dense and um, and compacted as possible. When we have the pile, when we, we've made the pile in 12 to 24 hours, that pile should be at 120 to 150 degrees. Why does that happen? All the microbes in that gut are starting to work. They're inoculating the pile. The liquids are mixing with, uh, with the carbon. And the whole mixing process starts at that point and keeps going. 
if we put manure in the bottom of that pile, if we put a dense material in the bottom of that pile, no air will be pulled into that pile. It's called the chimney effect. So the, the pile heats up, the center heats up, heat rises. If we can't pull in any air in, in through the bottom, then the process stops. So it's got to work that way, and we have to make sure that we have good light mayor airy material around it. So it's an envelope of carbon. We really are putting an envelope of carbon around that whole, the whole animal. So I said in 20, 12 to 24 hours, that pile should heat up. Usually before I leave a site, um, the animal heat, heats up. Um, in three to four months, we'll have clean bones, and I'm talking about a 1,200-pound 1, animal, 1,200 pounds of flesh. Three to four months, clean bones. Um, but we don't have mature compost at that point. We still have immature compost, even though uh, the bones are, are fairly clean. In 12 months, boy, we're way behind. In 12, <laughs> 12 I'll get it. In 12 months, um, we, have, we can have a mature product and we can use some of that. Um, frozen animals should be put in piles. If we have frozen animals, put it in a pile, envelop it in that carbon, let it work its way out because it will melt as soon as the temperature, the ambient temperature goes up, it'll melt and it'll, the process will start. This one's a little bit hard to see, but you can see over there, if you see those lines going up, they're up in an area where um, they're reaching thermophilic temperatures and that's the 120 to 150 degrees. And I won't talk more about that one. Um, what do we do with it? We can reuse um, the product for a base. So if we know we're going to have, if we have a thousand cows, we have 4% mortality rate, rate, we're going to have 40 cows a year. That's a lot of cows to put in a pile and we will need a lot of space. So we can actually reuse those, the bone adds structure to the new base. So use those as the base and uh, reuse that carbon. Re remove the bones and land spread. If you have big ribs or skulls, you're going to puncture tires, and that's an expensive tire to puncture. So make sure that some of that stuff is removed if you're going to apply that directly. Use it in roadside projects. We usually use it in low public contact areas, and we tend not to use it on crops that are being used for human consumption. Uh, and that's just a conservative way. We have done a lot of research on this to know that the process works, we're killing the pathogens, and we can use it. But we don't use it on food, food crops. Um, plant a tree in memory of the horse. It's a great way to use that compost. But for a horse, you're probably going to use that. Um, you're probably just going to leave that pile for a longer period of time. It's a pile of carbon sitting off to the side, hopefully. Um, the natural rendering, the poultry one that I sent around has all the PPE restrictions or all the P PPE recommendations, so personal protective equipment. If we have a disease outbreak, these are the ways that you should act and react um, because we work with a lot of large scale mortality. Uh, recently, we had an outbreak of high path avian influenza in Modesto, California, so I was called out to direct. I guess, um, and we composted 140,000 birds, turkeys, in that situation. So we use this for all different things. We all had our PPE on because we don't want to be exposed to the disease um, and transfer the disease out off that poultry farm. So important stuff. We have fact sheets, posters, and videos for almost all of our species, all, all of the main species. So go on our website, everything's downloadable for free. Um, who's from Florida? Yeah, <laughs> I put this one in for you. So if you live in Florida, you might have another disposal method. <laughs> this was a 22-foot alligator that they did end up shooting. Um, but it was taking a deer, probably a dead deer, but a deer in its mouth. Um, just quickly, I'm going to go through just a couple more. We have done quite a bit of research, as I said, on all mort aspects of mortality composting. Uh, do the drugs persist in livestock carcasses? We were talking about the chlorid and, and that, and other people will talk more about that. But um, we looked at barbiturates because we're euthanizing our horses, uh, oftentimes. I mean, sometimes there, there are other ways that they die, but, but a lot of times we have to euthanize in a horse, and it's euthanized with a barbiturate. Um, 
we wanted to know whether that was going to affect things. And frankly, we did well. It, the barbiturates do break down very well. And we did a funny thing. We were looking. We always look underneath our piles to see what the micro microbial activity is. And I dug down under the pile, and there are worms there. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. It didn't kill the worms. But then I realized that they're not mammals, and they don't react to barbiturates. So I was just being stupid. But you know. Um, NSIIDs, your ibuprofen and stuff like that, um, breaks down before it leaves the body. It just doesn't, we don't see it in the piles. And we also did ivermectin, looked at ivermectin, uh, horses that are continuously wormed or periodically wormed, and that broke down in a field, it takes a long time to break down. If we just spread it, it's going to take a while, it could, take, it could take months, depending on temperatures and moisture. Um, but in the compost pile, it was six to eight days. So it was very quickly that heat just broke that, the NSAIDs down, or the, the ivermectin down. So we had good results there. But um, we also did a comparison to burial with the barbiturates. Uh, we wanted to see if the, if the barbiturates would break down in lower temperatures, in, in soil temperatures, and we actually had pretty good results there as well. They did break down in soil, in soil. so burial, for that reason, is not a negative. For getting it closer to the water table, it is uh, more of a problem. And that's it. Sorry, I went a little over. <laughs>